This video will be a very short overview of a fascinating little MS-DOS video game title I stumbled on during a stream recently. It's short because there's an ulterior motive to my uploading it, which you'll see at the end. Let's go ahead and get into the game. It's made by Future Fashion, the company name of one Thomas Geschwantner, who as far as I can tell only made the one game, and it's this. Dream World Adventure. First off, I love the title screen with all these scanned in animal drawings and this quirky little guy in the middle. And this game just generally presses my buttons in the graphics department. All the soft gradients here and the colorful text of the intro, despite it all being in German, it's both nostalgic and just a very nice aesthetic if you ask me. The menu itself is pretty pleasant to look at. There's more gradients and big gray buttons with lush images on them. It's kind of reminiscent of one of my favorite games of all time, Laser Light from Pixel Painters. The setup window is pretty fun too. Instead of buttons, there's flip switches for all the settings. That's really delightful. There's an info button that takes us to this interface that resembles Windows Hypertext Help. You click on these sections and then each one has potentially multiple pages of information. It's pretty unusual to have such a thorough help system in a game of this vintage and style, but again, you'll see we're not gonna need very much from here. Here, let's go ahead and get started so you get a notion of what this game is like. The first thing we see is the game world. We can slide back and forth manually if we like to get an overview of the map. We can hit start or we can hit F1 for some control settings. Once again, I'm such a fan of all the gradients that are in use here. Some of the interface is a little abstract. Like for instance, I don't know what this joystick is supposed to be. No joystick I know of looks like that. I don't have a joystick plugged in, but I suspect it's actually a visual interface to the control configuration. See, if I click on select keys here, that's not just an icon, those are actually the key settings that I'm doing. So I'm guessing if I had a joystick, this is where I would calibrate it and select which buttons do what. We can press F2 and that'll take us to another highly involved help interface. This shows us all the information about all the pickups that are in the game, all the monsters that are in the game, environmental hazards, bonus items, it even has a hint system. This is such an unusual thing to see in a game of this era, it's just really odd. I mean, sure, some games had instructions, but usually pretty sophisticated ones, like Laser Light that I showed you earlier, had a complete in-game help system, but that game was also very sophisticated. This one, as you're going to see, it really isn't. You can probably infer just from what you've seen already that this is going to be a pretty basic arcade-style platformer, and that's true, that's exactly what it is. And games of that sort, it's pretty strange for them to even have any in-game help at all. Normally it's just, you know, a couple full-screen pages of text, pictures of enemies, and point values, and that's about it. This is really unprecedented. One note before I start the game, I can't actually figure out how to exit. In the lower left it says press Strug Alt Escape to go to the main menu, but I don't know what Strug is. I thought it might be strong, but I've never heard of a key being called that. Even German keyboards don't have a key called that. So I can't go back to the menu without rebooting, and I can't put in a password. But anyway, let's start the game. Your eyes are not deceiving you, that really is it. It's a pretty simple collectathon platformer. The next level adds a pair of boots that lets you stomp on enemies and a little tutorial section to show you how to use them. There's spikes on the ceiling that'll kill you. These brown platforms melt. Uh, these enemies have to be avoided. And there we are. That's pretty much how the levels proceed. Each one, you know, introduces one or two new mechanics. There's enemies to avoid. You pick up bullets to let you shoot things. You gotta make sure to get everything because you'll need anything that's in the level that's an item. So if you miss something, you probably won't be able to finish the level without it. The fourth level introduces enemies you have to shoot in order to get through. It also introduces hamburgers. There's also teleporters and this circuit board that's needed to proceed. If you step on the right teleporter, you won't be able to exit. You gotta get the left one. This level introduces a mechanic where if you jump too high while getting the circuit board, you'll hit this sensor and close this gate so you can't proceed. The only solution is to die and try again. This time I'll hop only the right amount and I can get through. The game immediately becomes very difficult, which is common for this type of game. If you try to jump down here immediately, you'll die. You have to wait till this little joystick looking guy comes back and jump down in front of him. Otherwise you get trapped behind him where you can't either 
get over him or get past him or step on him. That's an enemy that'll kill you, so you've got to drop down and immediately press right or you'll fall into the pit. And there's the exit. Level 6 introduced a new mechanic. Stones, you have to have a key to get through. And as you can see, I've trapped myself down here. I didn't grab that circuit board because I got off on the wrong side of the pedestal in the middle, so I'm not able to progress. I have to kill myself and try again. Now the levels proceed just about like that. I haven't gotten very far, but looking at the enemy lists, I feel like I could pretty much suss out what this game is going to be like. It's a pretty typical semi-puzzle platformer of the era. There was no small number of these. One of the bigger ones was uh, John Romero's early title, Dangerous Dave. Almost precisely the same thing that we're playing here, and about five years older as well. There was also Secret Agent Man from Apogee. That one was, I think, even older than Dangerous Dave. It had, it had pretty much the same style of play. You had to get certain items, you had to not get hit by enemies, or you had to shoot them, but you had limited bullets, so you couldn't just shoot everything. You had to collect keys, and you had to collect them in a particular order, or otherwise you wouldn't be able to proceed. You could easily get yourself trapped. You'd have to replay levels over and over and over until you got the right Simon Says pattern to things. Now the thing about this is that this sort of game is really easy to program. I mean, I'm not saying I could whip it up in a night, but a lot of people could, and I think back then a lot of people did. Even without a lot of tools that we have nowadays, Unity and pre-made graphics libraries and that sort of thing, it still just wasn't a very big lift to make a game like this. It's rudimentary movement, gravity, some very simple interactions with enemies and items, collision detection, and that's about it. So why am I showing you this very boring game that's a dime a dozen and doesn't really merit any notice? Well, let's die and go back to the menu, and then I'll be able to show you. I think if I flip this switch, you'll start to understand. The music is good at first, and then after a while you think to yourself, this is great, and then after a little bit longer you think, this is breathtaking. I mean, there were some DOS games with good music, but at most, like a minute and a half long loop. This music is something different. It, it has a definite melodic theme, but periodically, like every couple of minutes, it changes, and when it does, it feels like a new verse or movement, but I've listened to it for literally hours at this point, and it feels like there's infinite movements. I never really feel like I'm hearing the same melody. This music is generated via FM synthesis, the primary or only option on the AdLib and Sound Blaster cards that were the dominant method of making video games sound at this time. FM has the advantage that you can create instruments parametrically. It's a full FM synthesizer as opposed to the more modern methods of playing back recorded waveform samples or continuous PCM audio. That means when you play a note, rather than being stuck with whatever was recorded by somebody in a sound studio, that note is generated mathematically from the interaction of multiple simple waveforms, and the terms that generate those waveforms are relatively simple ones. Not the actual math. FM synthesis is not easy to understand. Most games at the time used FM music that was painstakingly handcrafted by composers who sat and tweaked instrument patches for hours until they found the sounds they wanted. But, I've seen synthesizers and software that locked the settings into limited values that all sounded good, and I wonder if that's what this is. Maybe the developer came up with an algorithmic approach to generating music by playing a simple loop with a handful of bass melodies, and periodically generating new instruments that cause the tracks to sound so different that a virtually infinitely long song is generated. I could believe it, there's definitely software that does that nowadays, and the concept is nothing new. I think the BBC was experimenting with it in the 60s. But the question is, what's it doing in this video game? One theory is that Thomas came up with this experimental music generator on its own and then decided one day to make a game and figured it would be a good place to showcase this neat toy he'd made. Another is that he made the game, decided he needed music, didn't want to just compose a simple loop that people would get tired of, and decided that creating a music generator was a reasonable tangent to go off on. This is an enormous yak shave, as many programmers would call it, but it kind of fits with the rest of the game. This game is so simple, especially for 1995 when PC games had started becoming much more sophisticated. Why is it so overwrought? It's just this basic arcade game that you would expect from the late 80s or like 1991, but for 95? It's such a simple game, it has a lot of things that seem out of place. Why is it have mouse support that only works in very limited parts of menus instead of just simple keyboard shortcuts? Why does it have a whole multi-window help system instead of a few simple pages with brief descriptions like every other game of this type? Why is the music made with an algorithmic music generator that most synth nerds I know would pay out the ass to get their hands on? 
It's probably, I'd guess, because Thomas was a giant nerd and loved computers. Back when I was young and had fantasies about making video games, but no real notion of what that involved, I did spend many hours writing little programs that generated pictures on the screen and moved images around, and I even got so far as some basic game mechanics. With no sense of the world's pitfalls and necessities, and no concept of wasted time, I enjoyed that act of semi-automatic creation, where I realized my ideas in the unique, limited way that computers could at the time, and then set the computer off to do it for me. I was happy to do that for its own sake, just watching it do what I asked it to, and make things from scratch, but things that I'd sort of instructed it to do, that was cool. If I put my back into making a video game, I think it would have had unnecessary mouse input because that would have been a cool thing I was proud to know how to do. It would have had an overwrought help system, although I probably would have gone for some sort of visually impressive parallax scrolling thing. And if I had the faintest idea how to make music, I'd definitely have been proud to say I'd made a game with infinitely looping music that was never the same melody twice. So that's the whole reason I wanted to show you this. If you like this music, and everyone I've played it for so far has, you're in luck. I ripped over an hour of this mutating melody and I uploaded it to my website, archive.org, and you can find those links in the description as well as a link to a YouTube video with nothing but this game's incredible dreamlike soundtrack for an hour and 15 minutes. You'll have trouble turning it off, trust me. That's all I had to show you. Thank you for watching.